Historians have always known, but to Christians brought up in the belief that Jesus was the only child of Mary who remained virgin, it will come as a surprise that the real Jesus had several brothers and sisters, and that after Jesus' death, his followers are led by his brother James, also called the Just. Eisenman believes some of the scrolls and this early church have much in common. Both call themselves the humble, meek, or poor, ebionim. So the scrolls are using the same word to refer to the community of the righteous teacher that early Christianity uses to refer to the community of James. Let's be very careful. Are you saying these are the early Christians or not? Not early Christianity as we know from the scripture as we have it. This is early Palestinian Christians. Now we have to, to, to decide what is meant by Christian in Palestine in this period to understand your or answer your question. And that is another technical discussion that we can have. Do you mean there is a difference between the early Christians of fact or the early Christians of faith? Of course. There is a, a, a vast difference, and I don't even know if they were ever called Christians. Neither would they have seen themselves as Christians. The Bible hardly talks about this earliest church, about James and other members of the family of Jesus. They didn't see themselves as a separate church. Their only difference from others lay in the hope that Jesus would one day return as a Messiah. But otherwise they were strict and pious Jews, much in the mold of the writers of the scrolls. Again, the scrolls make no clear mention whatsoever, but if some are from these times indeed, Eisenman sees a fascinating parallel. Three persons emerge from the scrolls. The leader, called the Righteous Teacher, who did not found the movement, but gave it direction. The wicked priest, an outside enemy, and probably Jerusalem's high priest leading the establishment. And a third and fascinating figure, once part of the movement, but now outcast. He's called the Liar. And this liar is specifically said to teach straying from the law, to remove the boundary markers which the forefathers, the ancestor, had set down to lead people astray in a trackless waste and to have denied the law in the midst of the whole community. Well, nothing could be a better description of what Paul does in both the Jerusalem conference in the book of Acts and in his writings. Paul considered as the liar? The Gospels narrate how Paul, sent by the high priest to arrest followers of Jesus, is converted by a blinding vision on the road to Damascus, Syria. In the Dead Sea Scrolls, Damascus is used as a code name for the region where the wilderness camps are located. It has been proposed by some scholars is that Damascus here was a district within the, the Roman uh, administrative system and so that what you have in the word Damascus is simply another term for the Qumran region. A conversion here to the beliefs of James, but later bringing him in conflict with it? Though most scholars, including Larry Schiffman, categorically reject linking one with the other, it does tie in with history. Very early within Jesus' followers, there seems, as far as we can reconstruct, to have developed two approaches. One approach, for example, James the Just personified this, wanted to keep Christianity essentially a form of Judaism, practicing all Jewish rituals. The other approach was to see Christianity as a worldwide movement and to take it outside of Palestine and outside of the Jewish community. And this, of course, is best known from the writings of Paul. We have in this James-Paul confrontation the very epitome of what Qumran is talking about. The letter of James, he speaks of, you know, if you break one small point of the law, you're guilty of breaking it all. Therefore, be a keeper, not a breaker, be a doer. All words we get in the Qumran vocabulary. James is totally representative of the Qumran school of thinking. Commitment to the laws of the country, to the independence of the country, resistance to foreign rule, resistance to foreign sacrifice in the in the temple, resistance to anything foreign. Uh, Paul is the very opposite. And Paul's way. Paul, the very opposite. 
Paul's way leads to the Gentile mission, speaking in tongues. Uh, Paul says that we are all equal in Christ Jesus. We're all one in Christ Jesus. Paul represents Hellenistic cosmopolitanism. Paul has come several years after the death of Jesus from distant Tarsus, from the world of Greeks and Romans. He is from good family and maybe even distantly related to Herodians, devils incarnate who are pious Jews. He doesn't resent the Romans. On the contrary, he is even a citizen of Rome and protected by its power. Those groups that were uh, arguing against Paul used the same language uh, to refer to him, calling him either an enemy, an adversary, a liar, a tongue, a man who could not control his tongue, using even the similar imagery that you have at Qumran, spouter of lying. The quarrel with the followers of James reverberates in the scriptures. And when he preaches opening the faith to Gentiles in the temple, Paul is beset by a crowd of angry Jews who try to kill him. Roman soldiers are at hand to carry him to safety. Out of Paul's pen comes another messiah, respectful of the powers that be, who turns the other cheek and renders unto Caesar what is Caesar's. Paul literally knows nothing about Jesus whatsoever. There's one fact he seems to know that he was crucified and came to a bad end. Other than that, he has no intimate materials. That's very surprising. Someone who lives in such proximity and would have known stories and heard stories from other people knows so little about this person. The figure Paul does know is this mystery figure who is revealing things to him from a heavenly position, the figure he calls Christ Jesus in heaven. It's the Holy Spirit mechanism that gives Paul the revelations about this Christ Jesus in heaven. But that's why Qumran groups would have referred to such a person as a man of lies or a dreamer or whatever, because obviously in a situation like that, the Christ Jesus in heaven becomes whatever you think he, he should be. That doesn't mean that that has anything to do with the earthly Jesus. Now, who would have known the earthly Jesus? Ah, oh, well, people like James, the person who lived with him, succeeded him, was martyred in the way he seems to have been martyred. So I say, once you found the historical James, you in effect have found the historical Jesus. Dispelled abroad repeatedly, Paul spreads his word to the outside world, away from the church of James. It is a mission better suited to the world of Gentiles, Greeks, Romans. The message of a Christ for everyone, a Jesus milder than the Messiah in the mold of the Dead Sea Scrolls. The vocabulary is the same. The concepts are inverted into their mere opposite. Instead of aggressiveness, we get passivism. Instead of militancy, we get accommodation. Instead of this worldly apocalyptic messianism, we get otherworldly spiritualized messi me messianism. Instead of a messiah leading uh, the heavenly host in a final apocalyptic war against all, all evil on the earth, we get a, a messiah doing miracles and s a spiritualized uh, supernatural um, figure. The answer is very simple. The answer is because Roman power dictated a non-threatening, non-militant, non-aggressive messianic movement that it would tolerate. The scrolls were refused to give this interpretation. The people of the scrolls refused to be part of this accommodation. In fact, the people of the scrolls were the very opposite, and they paid the final price. I believe one of the reasons the scrolls are in the caves is because no one could come back and get them. That means all of them perished. The year is 67, a full generation after Jesus dies. The Jews stand up against the power of Rome, spurred on by a star prophecy, which foretells the coming of a new world ruler to chase all evil from the earth. But no Messiah rises. The apocalypse turns into catastrophe and holocaust. Vespasian, later emperor of Rome, raises and plunders Palestine. The Jews, smoked out from desperate last stands, are decimated. Tens of thousands are crucified. People without number killed by the sword or carried into slavery. Jerusalem burns. The temple is razed to the ground, its treasures looted. In this holocaust, the writers of the Dead Sea Scrolls vanish and the church of James evaporates. What's left are the communities Paul has established. They shape what will become Christianity and the Gospels. 
no eyewitness accounts written by apostles, but separated from the real life of Jesus by one or more generations and the rift of Holocaust. Mark and Luke were written from 70 to 90 after the rising, Matthew from 80 to 100, and John even later, three or four generations after Jesus. How accurate are their Gospels? A crucial event for Christianity is the resurrection. How is its discovery described? In Mark, three women see a young man dressed in white. In Luke, three women and three men see two men in brilliant clothes. In Matthew, two women see one angel. In John, only Mary Magdalena sees two angels. In compiling its New Testament, the Church of Paul had many conflicting testimonials to choose from, and much was decided by contemporary politics. The selection would need to have a wide appeal and exclude what made it unpalatable for Gentiles. It would need to affirm a break with Judaism and deflect attention from the original church in Jerusalem. And ideally, it would transfer any blame attached to Rome in the death of Jesus to the Jews. Thus, Jesus becomes almost a non-Jew. The only form of messianism Rome was willing to live with was the form we now call Christianity that later was in fact adopted into the Roman Empire in the way that we know it after 300 years. The only form of Judaism Rome was willing to live with is the form of Judaism we now know and these are the implications for Judaism that is rabbinic Judaism, Pharisee Judaism coming into rabbinic Judaism. Now the implications for Judaism are as extreme as the implications for Christianity because both have the same pharisaic view towards Roman power that I have been emphasizing. That is one of accommodation. And the star prophecy is used by its founder, an obscure rabbi that most of the world hasn't really heard of, Rabbi, rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai. Jews know him, but others don't know of him very, very well. He's described in the Talmudic materials as having himself smuggled out of Jerusalem in a coffin at the time of the war against Rome, 66 to 70 AD. And he has an arrow shot into the Roman camp saying, Rabbi Yochanan is a friend of the emperor. Now that's an incredible thing. It shows the orientation of the Pharisee party. They were accommodating to Rome. He's then brought into the Roman camp, and he applies the messianic prophecy to Vespasian. Vespasian is the future Roman emperor to be the destroyer of Jerusalem, the father of the new imperial family called the Flavians. And the he leader, says, the general of the Romans. Right, and he says, you are the world ruler called from Palestine to rule the world. What this person has done is applied the most precious prophecy of his people to the destroyer of his people, the destroyer of the temple, and the destroyer of, the, of his homeland. Nothing could be more cynical. Nothing could be more humiliating. Now, what do we have in the scrolls? In the scrolls, we have the literature of the people who would not compromise. Now, we may believe that Rabbi Yochanan, or Jesus' policy, turning the other cheek, or as Paul say, says the Roman authorities are the authorities that you must accept, we may, uh, uh, we may believe that that's pr pragmatic and the wisest policy to follow, but you cannot help but admire these people. Whether we agree with them or not, these people were willing to go the whole way. These were the martyrs of the period. The others were the accommodators. And the reason they didn't survive is because they were willing to go the whole way, and the literature we have that has come back to haunt us all is the scrolls. Nikea 324, three centuries after Jesus. Constantine, first Roman emperor to have embraced Christianity, has summoned the bishops. The empire is rent by bitter theological dispute about the true nature of Jesus, man or God. What Constantine imposes will become the basis for the Christian creed up until today. This is the creed to which we have unanimously declared ourselves signatories. In true Roman tradition, by a majority vote of the bishops and on imperial decree, Jesus becomes a God. Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God, begotten from the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made... A course set by Paul is concluded. All other voices are silenced. 
the Dead Sea Scrolls speak of sons of God in a plural way. They are the perfect, and they are the people who are perfectly carrying out the law. How would the historic Jesus have felt if he would have known that he would be termed the divine son of God and only one? I think he would have been horrified, completely horrified. It's the very opposite of everything that he would or could have represented in the Palestine that we're talking about. Eisenman's views are fiercely contested. Maybe his ideas say more about the Bible than about the Dead Sea Scrolls, but they rekindle facts historians have been considering for hundreds of years. Did the church get its facts about Jesus right? How much of the mystery of Christ is based on historic reality is open to question. How much that matters remains a question of faith.